Well, after surviving a vote of confidence, the UK's Theresa May took her Brexit fight to Brussels, seeking more support. A new vote on Brexit could take place as soon as as January, but the EU is making it clear that they're not going to renegotiate a deal. So what happens now? Let's ask European Parliament member Nigel Farage, who's usually very shy about giving his own <laughs> opinions on these things. But since he's in Brussels, I think he's more motivated to do so. Now, she did win her no confidence vote. You got to give her that, Nigel. But she, she does she still have the political wherewithal, the power in Brussels to get a new deal? Well, she won her vote, you're absolutely right, but the vote of no confidence was 37%. Mm -hmm. and, given, and given that over a third of the vote are ministers and on the government payroll of the backbenchers, a majority voted against her. Now, one thing's clear. At the end of a big dispute, if the losing side don't accept it, it hasn't gone away. What I've seen today are the losing 37% getting even more mutinous in their language against her. So she came here today um, having won a victory, but not a particularly decisive one. Uh, let me tell you, I've been in that building behind me today in the European Council. I mean, the UK is now a laughing stock because she's, because she's come here on bended knee saying, please, please, can I get some legal concessions on the withdrawal agreement I signed with you three months ago? And guess what? The German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, weakened though she may be, but don't forget the Germans run Europe, of course they do, said there are no concessions. So she is getting nothing out of tonight. Wow. She will go back to London tomorrow, further humiliated. And I can honestly, I tell you, this deal she signed is not passing in Westminster. Nigel, I, I'm glad you mentioned the reception today and her inability to negotiate. It seems to me that she has really not played a very strong hand, and she has a pretty strong hand, beginning with the fact that she, the UK runs a pretty hefty trade deficit with the EU. Do they, are, are those companies in Germany and France completely immune to the idea that they may lose that trading relationship and it's going to hurt them worse than it might hurt the EU, uh, UK? Well, of course that's right. You know, I mean, one in three German motor cars that are sold outside Germany are sold to the UK. We are their biggest customer. Do you know, last year we bought 20 million bottles of French champagne. We buy Belgian <laughs> chocolate. We are mad. And, and all of it's great. I've got no problem with any of it. But, but you know, unlike, unlike most people in politics, I spent 20 years working in business before doing this. And the one thing I know is the customer is king. It's the client that has the cards to play. But Theresa May, mm. as a career politician who'd never worked in business, didn't have the wit to understand it. And here's the problem. She has signed herself up to a deal that would leave us potentially trapped indefinitely inside European Union law. That is why not only has she failed as a negotiator totally, but it's why, it's why this deal cannot get through. And that then opens up in January a range of possibilities, some of which are not very pretty. Nigel, let's talk about the possibilities because you said the customer is always right. So let's talk about the customers and the Brexit yeah. tears because they don't want this middle ground or whatever you want to call Theresa May's negotiated deal with the EU. They don't want the no deal, hard Brexit. So what do they want? Well, hang on a second. Um, the, the Houses of Parliament do not want a WTO Brexit. And bear in mind that all trade that takes place between the US and the UK takes place on WTO. All our trade with China takes place on WTO. 90% of global trade takes place on WTO. But it's been so demonized by the big global corporates that dominate European politics and sadly British politics too, that it looks, like an, it looks to be an unattractive option. But let's talk about the real customers, shall we? Let's talk about the real clients, because they're the voters, not the members of parliament. And the voters, since that referendum, despite a tidal wave of negativity coming from all over the world, apart from Donald Trump, of course, who does support Brexit, I'm very pleased to say, but despite all of that, we have not changed our minds. So my view is, whatever happens in parliament, and even if the worst case scenario comes to pass and they force us to vote again in a second referendum 
on the same subject, which of itself would be an outrage, a democratic monstrosity. But even if they do, we will say leave again. Mm. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Hey, Rogers, Nigel, Jonathan, it's great to see you. And it's, Nigel, it's great to see you. It's wonderful, wonderful to have you on the program, of, of course. Such an honor, especially with the architect of Brexit. But I want to ask you, I understand what people want. I understand what you voted for. This deal right now is not what anybody voted for. So it seems to me that it's a binary option. It seems to me that there's either going to be another referendum, which they hope will change the vote, or that there's going to be a hard Brexit. I know what, at least I think I know what you want, but what do you think will happen? What do you, do you think it's going to be a hard Brexit or do you think it's going to be a new referendum and <coughs> well, a new vote? Well, I'll tell you what, I will now be objective. I will not talk my book. I will not talk with my heart or what I want because I, you know, I've got no problem with a so-called hard Brexit because that makes us an independent, self-governing, democratic nation that controls its own borders, makes its own trade deals. I could go on for hours, but there isn't time. However, um, I think our parliamentarians uh, lack the courage to believe that the UK is good enough to run its own affairs. I believe if the prospect is there of a WTO hard Brexit, our <coughs> politicians will intervene and one of two things will happen. Either the Article 50 leaving date will get extended for a year or two and the can gets kicked down the road and within that I begin to think the prospect of a second referendum, I'm sad to say, but it is getting greater. Hmm. Nigel, it's Jonathan Hoenig. Thank you for being with us. In effect, what principles do you think, assuming there is a Brexit, I know you've been a big proponent of it, what are the principles that could make uh, the UK once again the most prosperous and powerful economy in the world? Basic principles that would make it so, such a powerful economy once again. Well, I think the sovereignty point um, isn't just some sort of romantic notion. What it means is that we would be in control of the laws for our financial services industry, our manufacturing industry, our fishing industry. And I think it's more appropriate to make laws for your own businesses in your own country rather than have it done in Brussels by a bunch of old men that you can't vote for and you can't remove. <laughs> um, but, there's, but there's something missing. There's, oh no, well, they are a bunch of old men and they are unelected. The whole thing's an outrage. But, but here's something else. There's a word that I used to hear back in the 80s when characters like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were on the world stage. That word was competitive. And by being outside the European Union, by being outside very backward laws, whether it's on the environment, whether it's on employment, we could become competitive. We could undercut Europe. We could become cheaper. We could become a place that global investors want to come in an even bigger way than they do now. You know, we are a great country. We've got the oldest functioning democracy in the world. We speak English. We've got a relationship with the USA. We've got a relationship with the Commonwealth. We can do so much better being outside a European Union and one that is failing. Look at France, yeah. look at Italy, look at Hungary, Poland. This thing isn't even going to be here in 10 years' time. This train is headed for a crash in the buffers. I do not want to be on that train when it gets there. You know, we all remember that wonderful relationship that Reagan had with Thatcher. They were both as committed to the free market as you just enunciated yeah. so well. Nigel, thank you so much for being here. Please come back and see us again. Appreciate it.